This is the 82nd Airborne Division, fearless among fighting units. From Fort Bragg, home of the Airborne and the center of the military universe, this is the All-American Legacy Podcast. An inside look at the 100-year history of the 82nd. They are all American all the way. Welcome back to the All-American Legacy Podcast. I am Lieutenant Colonel Joe Bacino. We have a great episode today. We're taking a bit of a break from our historical narrative and our chronological history to feature an important story for our division. For today's episode, our Staff Sergeant Rainier spoke with retired Staff Sergeant Travis Mills. Travis is a truly remarkable person and a real inspiration. He really has an incredible story. In 2012, while deployed, Travis was injured by a roadside bomb. He lost both arms and both legs. He is one of only five quadruple amputees from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to survive. He recovered at Walter Reed and reconciled with the fact that he no longer had arms or legs. He now serves as an inspiration and really is a symbol for the paratrooper spirit. In 2013, he founded the Travis Mills Foundation, a nonprofit formed to benefit and assist veterans injured in combat. He wrote a best selling book, Tough As They Come. He's been the subject of an award winning documentary, Travis, A Soldier Story, and he's been featured on many shows to include uh, Bill O'Reilly on Fox News. You know, we've spoken with some legends and heroes from World War II, and I think it's appropriate to put Travis in that category. He really has something to say to our current paratroopers and to the, to the entire country today. So here is our Staff Sergeant Will Rainier talking to Staff Sergeant Travis Mills. Uh, Travis, you were in the 4th Brigade Combat Team, is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Matter of fact, 4th Brigade Combat Team was uh, formed when I got there. So it was only three brigades of combat, te- uh, three brigades, and then they did the fourth one for the deployment cycles. Also, I should have started with this in the beginning. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time. I know you're really busy. you got a lot of stuff going on with the, the foundation and the family and uh, your book, and I know you spend a lot of time speaking, so we really do appreciate it. Oh, I would do anything for the a Second Airborne Division. It's the greatest <laughs> division ever. <laughs> hey, so one of the things that really struck me uh, going through your book and, and reading your story, um, there really are a... Uh, a striking number of similarities between you know you and I and a lot of soldiers. You really kind of do have that all American uh, story that so many people can relate with. Uh, you're from Vassar, Michigan, um, not a very small town or not a very big town. Um, you know you graduated uh, what 2005. That's the same year I graduated. You played football. Um, what kind of brought you, uh, like so many other people, what brought you from your small town there in, in Vassar to want to join the Army? Well, I think since we're, uh, we're doing a podcast about um, the 82nd Airborne Division and the Brotherhood, I might as well tell the real story. Okay, let's I hear it. I play college football. I went to play college football. While I was at college playing college uh, football at a small community college, I had a girlfriend, and she said, you should move home and go to college with me. And, uh, <laughs> that's an awful idea. And then I thought about it and said, okay, I'll do that when the season's over. So the baseball coach of the college said I should play baseball for him. I said, my girlfriend said I should move home, and I'm going to do that. And that gentleman said, that's a stupid idea. And I looked at him and said, you're stupid. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so I went home for my girlfriend. When I got home for my girlfriend, I met her boyfriend, Colin. And that got weird. And uh, <laughs> I met with the Army recruiter. They told me about the Airborne Infantry. And I was like, yep, that's what I want. I signed the contract. Um, I got you know the bonus so I could pay back my college uh, student debt and have a little bit extra on the side. And I shipped out within three weeks because I needed to change. I wanted to try something new. And when they showed me guys jumping out of airplanes and on the ground fighting, I said, that's exactly what I want. So I joined the military. I went to basic training, and then I was shipped off from basic and airborne school to the home of the 82nd Airborne Division, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Yeah, and that you know that really is a relatable story for so many of the guys that you talk to. Um, just looking for a change. Uh, things aren't really working out the way that they thought, but uh, you know, a lot of people look at the army, and not a lot of people are are willing to do that, going to jump school, and uh, you know they kind of get psyched out at the idea. But you know, going through airborne airborne school there at Benning, you know, you get it beat into your head, just going through the motions. You stand up, you hook up, and you start walking toward the door, and 
and I'm sure you felt the same way. As soon as you jump, you have this split second of what in the world did I just do? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah we do. And then, you know, you know and we were going for our first jump, and one guy was so nervous, he laid on the ramp of the plane and started crying, saying he wasn't going to do it. So, they, you know, they took him aside, took him to the drop zone. We all jumped out, and when we landed, he said, oh, I think I can do it now. And then they kicked him out because he wasn't tough enough to be in the airborne. But, uh. But yeah, I, I mean, you just get up there and you, and you go, and then all you got to remember is your training. You just, you know, hold the static line out, keep your one uh, second separation, pass it off to the AG or the, the safety, and hop out. That's it. So what? Uh, what you, that must have been what? Two thousand six, two thousand seven, when you went through airborne school. Oh no, two thousand five. Uh, yeah, two thousand six. You're right. Two thousand six yep. in March, I went to basic, and then I went to airborne school in the beginning of August, and made it to the A second in late August. All my buddies were like, hey, we're going to Fort Bragg. I'm like, all right, cool, I'll do that. So I got to Fort Bragg, and there was 21 of us. And 20 of them went to 1st Brigade to go to Iraq, and I went to 4th Brigade by myself. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it, it wasn't bad. I enjoyed my time there. I got to work for uh, Scotty D. Custer, who was a great nephew of the actual Colonel Custer that's so uh, famously known. And he was a wild man. But he did teach me one thing. The only thing better than a pair of vases is two pair. And they flex his <laughs> muscles at me. So I passed that along <laughs> to all my guys when I got them. Yeah, well, you got you got yeah you got your first pair pretty quick uh, once you got here. How many uh, deployments did you end up going on with uh, there with Fourth Brigade? Uh, I did three. The first one was fifteen month deployment. The next one was a year, and the next one after that was only two months. It was supposed to be nine months, but it only went for two, and then I got home a little early. Yeah, and and um, you know that was kind of there the time right there at the surge and and. Uh, just back to back deployments with so many so many people just kind of rotating in and out of Iraq and Afghanistan, um, but it really was that third deployment that kind of made you the man you are today. Um, so talk me through a little bit about you know what your role was there uh, at the time in the army as a squad leader, and just kind of talk me through um, that deployment. Absolutely. So um, everybody thinks the unit's the best. Obviously, we're all you know ten foot tall and bulletproof in the Eighty Second Airborne Division. But uh, I was with 4th uh, Brigade Combat Team with 4th Air and 3rd uh, Cavalry Unit. It was, a, um, you know, they had these coin platoons, so two infantry and two cab um, squads for each platoon, so four, you know, squads like normal. And I was a weapon squad leader, so, you know, I got to Afghanistan. My third deployment, you think the war is dwindling down after all the news you see and all the stories and reports, but we got there and we got put kind of in the worst situation. We had uh, most of the combat um, and firefights was, was in our sector, but... We got there, hit the ground running, firefights every day and things like that. But, you know, it was just part of the job. So I was in charge of the weapon squad. I had the heavy guns with me, the 240 Bravos. And I had two teams that we just, you know, every mission we had to be on, we had to make sure we were the superiority of fire and get the job done. So some squads would rotate, you know, get the day off, but we never did. We made sure we were out there so we could help out in any situation we found ourselves. Yeah, absolutely, and fire superiority really is the the key to to any firefight. You want to knock them down as quick as possible and, and give your guys the the opportunity to maneuver. Um, and and nothing you know nothing shuts up the enemy like getting the two forties and two four nines rocking. So such an important job that you have there, and you know it's really up to you guys to kind of set the tone for the rest of the operation because if you guys are not in the right position, you can't really initiate movement. Um, if you guys have a gun go down, you know, it really hampers our ability to, you know, move and, and just make sure that we get in and out as quick as possible. So you really were in a one of, if not the, you know, most important leadership positions there a non-commissioned non officer can have um, in the infantry. Yeah, I mean, it was a great responsibility. I was actually, um, I was the youngest C6 by three years, but I was very good at giving my first sergeant, you know, compliments. Like, first sergeant, is that a new haircut? First sergeant, I found this dirty pack of beer outside. I was wondering if he wanted it. No, um, no, the weapon squad there was a great job. I enjoyed it. You know, it's uh, it's something where you have to make sure that your guys know what they're doing, and they make sure they don't run through ammo too quick, but they also keep the enemy's head down. And uh, not to not to boast or brag or anything, but kind of gonna you know you know give myself a pat in the back. When I uh, had my uh, my incident, if you will, they were actually targeting the weapon squad. They weren't targeting. The, the actual like my squad like the guys in you know first and second and third squad they weren't trying to get those guys walking they were uh, apt to go after my weapon squad because we were just pegging them I mean when we get in firefights my guys are just ripping them apart yeah and, and you they could were trying to find the position that we would choose uh, and we'll we'll get into kind of the April 10th a little bit later but it really seems like that. 
the way that they they targeted that attack is they looked for the area that it seemed most likely you know looking at your past ttps and they it really seemed like it, it was pretty targeted they knew exactly kind of what what type of terrain you were going to look for and uh that's kind of how they they set so take me there to april 10th 2012 and um you know what uh kind of what do you remember from that day well, absolutely. I, I will say the enemy is always ever changing. So what their new SOP when we got on my third deployment was was that they were going to not booby trap the road, but they would booby trap the side of the road where the dirt mounds are at, and then they would shoot at us in hopes that we would run over to the dirt mound and take cover on top of an IED instead of trying to luckily step on one in the road. But on April 10th of 2012, we got a phone call from the village elders said there's an IED in the village. Can you come try you know find it and detonate it for us? And um, we went out as planned, you know, like usual, threw our gear on. And in front of me was my minesweeper, um, my, my private, that had the minesweeper on the stand of the mine hound, and he was looking for the bombs. And he swept the trail up and down, like our, you know, our SOPs were. And he went up and down the mound, uh, not once but twice, and nothing alarmed him on the mine hound that there was anything underneath there. So we came to a short halt. I said, all right, put the gun in place, told one of my, uh, you know, my, my assistant gunner, um, a private uh, theory. I said, hey, you know, I didn't throw the gun there. All right. And then we went to set the gun in place. I took my bag off. My bag was, you know, standard uh, amount of rounds that we would keep on us. So it was about 80 to 120 pounds any given day. And I dropped my bag on the ground right where we had just swept. And it turns out that the mine hound didn't pick it up for some reason. And under my bag was 13 IEDs in a row. Wow. So my bag hit the ground, set the, the pressure plate IED off. It immediately, you know, within an instant, went off, and it happened to rip my right arm and my right leg completely off. They disintegrated. They never were found. The other pieces of my uh, right arm and right leg. I hit the left side of my face in the ground. And I rolled over, and uh, started. To, my eyes started to swell shut. My left leg was hanging on my muscle and tendon, but snapped through the bone. And as I was laying on my back, kind of, you know, like a turtle on its back, my legs, my arm, my leg were in the air. My left leg was in the air. My left uh, ankle, I guess, the ankle bone was actually touching my thigh. It was just dangling down. And then my left arm was blown out, the wrist really bad, but it was still functional. Like I could still move my hand, my fingers that were left because my pinky and ring finger were mangled up and kind of destroyed. So I, uh, I reached over to my hand mic and I called my med or my, uh, LT and I said, Hey, six, this is four. I just hit a bomb. I need your medic with mine. I have injured guys because my minesweeper and my assistant gunner both take, uh, took really bad shrapnel. Yeah. So and my medic, Doc Basin. No, I, uh, you always take care of your guys first. They eat first, they get the rest first. And, and I let, you know, that's how I led, led from the front and made sure they were taken care of. And, um, you know, I, I know they'd say the same thing about me and my leadership. But when I got hit, I, uh, I actually, my medic came up to me because he was behind, you know, the, the file with the platoon sergeant. They came up to me and I said, Doc, you're not going to save me, so just go save my guys. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't suicidal by any means, but I just, you know, I, I I just let's face it. In all the years of war we've been in, I, you know, deployed three times. I just I didn't think I was going to make because I saw guys die for a lot, lot less of injury. Yeah. And I thought you know this is going to be a one to two minute deal. I'll bleed out and I'll be done. The only thing in my head I kept saying, do not go out like Saving Private Ryan when medic gets shot young for your mom. Yeah. And I just kept myself calm and I thought I'm not in control of what happens in the situation. So don't panic, don't freak out. Just whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But, so I told Doc Basin, I said, Doc, just go, save my guys, it's fine. And he said, let me do my job. I got in an argument with him, and he <laughs> finally said, you know, I'm going to do my job, just shut your mouth. And uh, and he went to work with Tourniquets, my platoon sergeant, uh, Sergeant Hambright, who is, I mean, I respect him the most out of anybody in the military I've ever met. Um, he did, uh, you know, Tourniquets on my left side, Doc Basin on my right side. Within 20 seconds, all four limbs were covered wow. um, with Tourniquets. Wow. And then... The other medic came up. They, you know, they went and checked out my guys. They were fine. One guy trapped into the face pretty bad, but his glasses saved his eyes. The other guy had big holes in his legs, but he was going to be okay. And they came up to me, and um, uh, Doc Voice came up. He was kind of worst trauma he'd seen so far, and he was like reassuring me, "You're going to be fine. You're going to be okay." And I finally had to like yell at him, like, "Hey, Doc Voice, you know, just shut up. Just do your job. You're fine. I appreciate it. You're going to be fine. I'll be okay. Just you know, get the job done." And I had to calm him down. And then they loaded me on the helicopter. And uh, on the helicopter, I flew with my two guys to the hospital. 
on the hospital, I yelled at the flight medic and said, hey, take your helmet off, give my guys water, tell them they're going to be okay, because one of my guys is yelling out in real bad pain. Yeah. He had every right. He was in, he was in pain, but I, I, kept, I yelled at the flight uh, medic three times, and finally I said a couple words in a louder voice that I can't repeat on the radio, but he took his helmet <laughs> off, and I said, give my guys water, tell them they're going to be fine. In the book, actually, there's the, the medics, actually, the email they sent to my wife about it, that um, that day is in there. I'm very proud of that. And then I made it to the operating table after I landed, and um, they went ahead and started working on me, and I kept telling them, quit touching me, I'm fine, leave me alone. I tried to sit up and get away from them. And they said, you know, Sergeant Mills, I don't know how you're still awake, but you need to go to sleep. And then I kicked in that I might not wake up for real, and I could show a little bit of fear, so I said, my little girl, am I ever going to see her again? And uh, they knocked me out. So they knocked me out. They started to, sorry about that. So they knocked me out. They started to undress me. And um, when they took my pants off, my left leg came with it. There was uh, 14 hours of surgery, nine doctors and seven nurses that worked on me. Two nurses for nine hours pumped air in and out of my lungs for nine hours. They had to have over 30 blood transfusions. And, um, you know, people were rushing. They were, like, rushing as fast as they could to donate from their body a positive blood to my body and, and universal blood. That's and crazy. then uh, my brother-in-law yeah. was deployed with me, not in my unit, but deployed with the 4th Brigade. And um, he went ahead and uh, found out the news, flew to, Kanda, you know, flew to Kandahar, and um, uh, was there by my side when they presented me with uh, my Purple Heart and everything. And then they flew me from there to Bagram two days later, and they took my hand off there. So I became a quadruple amputee because my skin had necrotized on my wrist area. And then two days later, on April 14th, they woke me up for the very first time on my 25th birthday. And my brother-in-law was in the room. He had to be the one to tell me I was quadruple amputee and everything that happened. That's a, it's a hell of a 25th birthday, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he kept saying, you got to call your wife. You got to call uh, your mom and dad. And I said, I'm not calling anybody. And I was pretty angry and upset, discouraged, thought I was a bad person. Maybe God hates me. I did something wrong in life. And he finally convinced me to call him. So I called my wife. And the only thing I said, hey, what's up? I love you. Goodbye. I called my parents and I said the same thing before I could hang up. My mom said, hey, Travis, happy birthday. And, um, yeah, so that's my 25th birthday. But then I called my unit. I didn't want to have them think, uh, you know, don't be down, don't be depressed, don't be upset. So I called them and I was smiling and I sang to everybody in the room. And then they told me all about how the next night they went out and they got everybody that was involved with putting those IEDs in. They went out on a night mission and, and they took care of the enemy. Um, my, my gunner, uh, he's now a staff sergeant. Staff Sergeant Neff, he, he was at the time a private PFC. He said, I got them all for you. Before they knew it hit them, there was four down. So, wow. so they went and told me they got, uh, they got the bad guys for me. It's, uh, that's, it's crazy to, you know, you hear these stories and you hear about guys like yourself and, and you know, what happens over there in Afghanistan. And it's hard for a lot of people to really, you know, to really understand what it all means. I think the the real moral of this, you know, people are quick, I think, to throw out the word hero because of what happened on April 10th. Um, but you, you don't really see it that way, do you? Uh, no, I mean, I didn't do anything more than anybody else. I had a bad day at work. But, I mean, everybody that's over in Afghanistan signed up, raised their right hand, took the oath, and volunteered. So, um, you know, the guys that saved me, my platoon sergeant and medics that ran up, they're heroes. You know, I, I've done heroic things. I've, I've gotten recognition, you know, for doing heroic things. On the first day we got to the country, we got in a huge firefight, and a guy went down, and I ran out and got him. But am I a hero because I got blown up? Absolutely not. I just feel like I was doing my job, and, and things went south quick. But but I've been fortunate. You know, after I got over the whole, like, self-loathing and, and upset about things the first week and a half that I was at Walter Reed. Yeah, I mean, there's I really no bad days on. after that, right? Not really. And once you find out life goes on, your wife, you know, I told my wife to leave me and she said, that's not how this works. I'm going to be here for you. <laughs> I told, you know, you know, I, I, I did. I said, take the house, the cars, everything you want is yours. I'll pay for anything you ever could possibly need or want. And um, she said, that's not how this works. My little girl was five uh, or six months old at the time. And I was still going to be her dad. So I went ahead and took it as a job. I started, you know, going down to the military advanced training center. And I was one of the first guys in that deployment to get hurt. We had a lot hurt, a lot of guys hurt. And I had to come to Walter Reed. But I would go down there, and the Marines were in there because they were on rotation as well. And I'd say, you guys just wait. Eight second guys are coming down here. We're all, you know. And I just, you know, everybody's like, this guy's kind of nuts. But my, <laughs> my physical therapy turned into my job. I did four hours of uh, physical therapy and eight, uh, four hours of occupational therapy a day, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, as much as I could. 
And um, they said, you'll be here, you know, for eight or for uh, three years. And I said, not a chance. I was there 19 months, so I got, you know, fully recovered, discharged, and retired from the military because uh, I just wasn't going to allow this to bra- drag me down. And, you know, and there's still a brotherhood in the bond that goes with the military because when I was at Walter Reed, I had a guy flying from Missouri to come say hi. He was a quadruple amputee. He's the second ever. There's five total. It's uh, Todd, Todd Nicely, hey, right? Life goes on. Yeah. Yep, Todd Nicely came and saw me. He's like, hey, man, life goes on, you know. And uh, once I realized that, I made it a point to meet everybody in their rooms um, for the year and a half that I was there. And I'd go in the rooms and I'd hang out, and um, I eventually became known as the mayor of Building 62. My daughter would strap into my wheelchair with me, seat belted in, and we'd go get grapes or cookies or whatever. And we'd go over to the hospital and go meet all these families, let them know life goes on. You know, keep your head up and keep pushing forward. And... Um, that's kind of how the book got started, how my documentary got started, and my motivational speaking got started. It was just because I would go around and try to give back to all these people that had, you know, kind of lost their way or didn't know what the future was holding, for, you know, was going to hold for them. I was even, I, w- I visited the Boston bombing victims at Spalding Rehab Center and was able to work out with them and say, hey, man, life goes on. Let's keep crushing it. When you get labeled a hero, and, and it's really not, I think it's not because of what happened on April 10th, but... But I definitely think that you deserve it for the the work that you did afterward. You wrote in your book, you know, you could have chosen to quit, or but you chose to go forward. And not only did you, you know, bring yourself forward just for your family, but you really you carried a lot of a lot of guys with you. Uh, when you look at the work that you've done, uh, speaking and you know the visits, like you said there in Building Sixty Two, and just trying to let people know, you know, that life goes on. I really think that you know if we're gonna if we're gonna use that that label hero, it, it definitely is more appropriate apply uh, more appropriately applied uh, in that context. And so you know I I'm sure you you've met thousands upon thousands of people who you know just want just want to you know shake your hand or give you a hug and just let them know like what you've meant to them. And and that really is you know. I think that's the most important part of your legacy. And and the great thing is that your legacy becomes, you know, the all-American legacy. You've shown that, you know, it doesn't matter how bad your wounds are physically, you know, life does go on. And it's important to remember that. It's important to remember that there are people who who still love you, who still who still count on you, who, you know, want to be there for you. And I can't think of a better person that embodies that spirit than uh, you. So you know, I really just want to take an opportunity and just, you know, thank you for on behalf of all of our listeners and everyone here at the 82nd. Well, yeah, I appreciate it. I'll tell you what. Uh, I would say I grew up in Michigan, but then I really grew up at Fort Bragg. And you know what? When you get told to do a task at Fort Bragg, it's not, well, I can't do that, or how am I going to do that? You get told a task, and they tell you, get it done. When I attacked uh, my, you know, recovery, I just thought, I got to get it done. I don't care how I do it, but I'm going to get it done. And when I go talk to these people, I'm not the touchy-feely sort. Like, I'll, I'll feel bad with you about your situation. I'll be uh, compassionate. But at the same time, I'm going to sit there and say, now let's get it done. Now we're going to figure a way to get better. And I really do think the A-Second gave me that no-nonsense, you know, kind of attitude so I can go through and get things done. We had a guy that was at the hospital that was double leg amputee, was afraid of falling, uh, had his legs, didn't want to learn how to walk because he didn't want to fall. And his therapist said, hey, Travis, can you come in and help him out? And he was there six months longer than I had been there already. So... I came in. He was leaning on my shoulder. I said, are you afraid of falling? He said, yeah. So I pushed him down. And I said, now get up. And he was on the harness system. He didn't hit the ground. He was on the harness system. I said, you're fine. So let's learn this together. And that's just kind of how I attack it. And I think it's uh, truly because of my leadership and the, and the way it is. You know, a second, I tell people I'm A-second um, second airborne, born and bred till the day I'm dead. And I truly believe that. And uh, I'm just thankful for the opportunity I had to, to jump out of airplanes and, and have the brotherhood that was bonded and, and to serve my country with the 82nd. Yeah. Hey, what's the uh, what's the one thing about jumping out of airplanes that you actually miss? Because I know it's not the waiting around uh, in the pack shed. Um, what do you miss about jumping? You know, I actually so I miss jumping. I'll give you that. But I'm, I was a I was a jump master. I, I'm not certified anymore. I guess I can't say I am a jump master, <laughs> but I was a jump master, and I miss that. Giving that brief and saying when I give you green light, go, and um, you decide not that today's not your day. I'll, you know, unhook you and sit you on the tail of the aircraft to give you a lawful order not to, you know, touch your equipment. But during that brief, I always say, but you're never going to hear that command. You're going to get out of that plane. You will get out of my my way and the paratroopers behind you way. And two kids checked me at the door on that. I said, green light, go. Green light, go. And I said, not today. I told you. 
and I threw a kid out, and I pushed another kid, you know, two different <laughs> times, which wasn't illegal. I mean, they were fine. They landed safely, and they thanked me later, but I told them, I said, I told you you weren't going to stand here in the doorway and freeze on me, and they were new, new privates, but, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I just incriminated myself. You can't prove I did it anyway. I mean, but, I think uh, I think your statute you know, of limitations is up, so you should be fine. But, I hope so. No, I mean, I, they were fine. They landed. They said thank you. Yeah, but, I know. Uh, I, I miss, know exactly I miss, what you uh, mean. I miss being in charge and stuff like that. Absolutely. Uh, I had pulled my my night AJ last night, and so tomorrow morning I'm putting on the I'm getting my senior wings, so I got my star, and so I know exactly what you mean. There's no other feeling like you know knowing. Regardless of rank or position, you know this is this is my aircraft, and I'm in charge. And everything that I do is for those for those jumpers. So I definitely uh, can I mean, relate. Tell you congratulations on that. Yeah, thank I was you. One night AJ away. I had enough. But I had one night AJ, and we just didn't get it done before I deployed. But so you know, some people were like, "Well, we can just pencil you in." I'm like, "No, no, no. I didn't earn it. I don't want it. If I didn't earn it." So I, I had a couple of AJs on like the toy drop, um, but it wasn't nighttime, so. Yeah. You know, either well, way. Either way. Sorry, I cut you off. That's con- congratulations. That is awesome. You know, I know uh, it probably probably hurts that you you never got your star. Um, but but you know you, you you're a jump master. You're still a brother in the paratrooper uh, family, and so you know that one's for you, buddy. Oh, I appreciate it. And, and you know what? I, I wish I did, but at the same time, things happen for a reason. Um, I'll tell you, I, I went to Utah and I spoke, and I had a driver out in Utah. And he, you know, drove us from the airport to the hotel and just kind of was talking with him. Politics. I know we're going to talk politics, but talking politics and talking about sports. And we got to the hotel and he's asking me all these questions about my life and how I keep doing it and stuff. And I just kind of was giving real answers. And then I went inside to check in and he told, uh, my father-in-law was with me. He said, Hey, I, I got to talk to Travis quick. Is that okay? And my father-in-law was like, yeah, no problem. He's normal. <laughs> and he came in and said, Hey man, you just saved my life. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean I saved your life? And he goes, well, I was going to kill myself next Thursday. I had it all planned out. I didn't think I had any purpose, but you just changed my life completely. And, um, and then he came back and drove me the next day to my next hotel at my different event down the road an hour and a half. And he's like, I'm serious. And, uh, you know, if I can have that kind of effect on people, I'm happy I can. I would never get blown up again. I don't, I would never go back in time and do it over, but since I can't change it fast, I might as well just make the best of it. And I think that's what, uh, that's what the eight second has instilled in me is always keep pushing forward and, and uh, improving your situation the best you can. Hey, so, absolutely. I take my daughter to school in the morning and uh, I, I get to travel and, and do a lot of fun, cool things. And, and I give back to my foundation. We bring people out that have been uh, critically injured from combat injuries and show them how to be um, out there in society and adaptive with kayaking and canoeing and fishing and just, you know, never live life on the sidelines or give up on yourself. Absolutely. So what's the next, uh, you know, what what do you see as the next the next chapter of your life then? Well, um, by the time that this gets out, I'll probably I probably won't get in trouble. I would imagine. So my wife's pregnant, so we have another kid on the way. She's ten weeks pregnant. We haven't announced it officially online, but, well, but we'll, uh, I mean, it's not like we're going to change the fact. So the next thing I'm doing is having a baby in in August. Oh, uh, that's <laughs> that's awesome. That is that's a yeah. That's congratulations to you, man. That's great. So we'll keep this close hold in, until yeah. until it's official. Uh, you don't have any plans for uh, May yet, do you? Uh, I don't. I don't. I ran into the command, the uh, uh, um, division commander of the 18th Airborne Corps, and, I, and uh, we talked a little bit. And I said, I'd love to come out to All American Week. And uh, you know, I'm really good at heckling people, but. I would love to come back. I need to go to the museum one more time. I gotta get some more memorabilia. <laughs> because I like to I like to pick up stuff from my walls and everything. Now I have an office to put all that memorabilia in, so I'm gonna be there shopping pretty soon. Uh, my brother in law still lives in Fort Bragg. So uh yeah, I mean I would be I, I guess I was planning on maybe making a trip if there's a possibility of me uh me going. Heck yeah, this is the year to do it too. It's the hundredth anniversary, so you know we don't do anything halfway out here, so it's gonna be it's gonna be quite the week. Um We'll get a uh, we'll get we'll get some information over to you and uh, we'd love to have you out here. We we'll look forward to seeing you. Oh, that would be awesome! And uh, of course, you don't do anything halfway. It's all the way. <laughs> I see what you did there. Well played. So thanks again uh, for joining us. It's uh, Staff Sergeant Retired Travis Mills again. His book Tough as They Come uh, is out there if you're interested in in learning more about Travis's story. And uh, you know, Travis, you truly are a paratrooper for life and a, a huge inspiration to so many people, whether they're you know, military, non-military, just people who you know, need that little push of uh, inspiration that you know, life does go on and, and you know, maybe my situation uh, is something that I can handle too. So 
Thanks for coming on today. Hey, one last thing. Uh, there's an interesting uh, part in your book there uh, when you're in Afghanistan uh, and you were awarded your Purple Heart. You mentioned that you had never seen the uh, the photo from that ceremony. Yeah, I, yeah, I never, I never did. My brother-in-law told me that there was pictures, but I never saw it. So interestingly enough, I was able to uh, go back in our archives and uh, the photographer, uh, uh, she's not in the military now, Amanda Hills, um, helped us out tremendously to track down these photos um, and so we want to make sure that you had those and uh, you could add that to your collection there. Oh I appreciate that yeah I'm uh, I, I was told that they were taken I just never saw them and then um, I appreciate you finding those tracking them down and uh, yeah it was, a, it was an interesting day interesting day that April 10th but no hey I, I do appreciate you doing that and having me on I would like to tell anybody that's listening if they want to check out anything on me, please visit travismills.org. That's the best way to find out what I'm up to or hit me up on social media and follow what we got going on because uh, it, it, it really is um, it's a fun experience I get to do now because I've learned to reminisce the past but don't dwell on it and keep pushing forward. Absolutely, and I think there's a lot of inspiration, so definitely check out uh, that website. Find Travis online on social media. Check out his book if you're interested. And uh, Travis, thanks again for joining us. Hey, thank you. Congratulations on the wings. That is an amazing accomplishment. Yeah. Take care. Have a wonderful day, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. All right, airborne. Airborne all the way. See you in May, hopefully. Bye-bye. So that was Travis Mills. A great discussion there. Um, really inspirational stuff. Next week, we'll come back to World War II with the first of a two-part episode on the 82nd Airborne Division on D-Day. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to the All-American Legacy podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes. The reviews help other people find the podcast. Special thanks this week to Brian Bird from uh, Fort Bragg for really helping us with the production. And uh, as always, the All-American Legacy podcast is produced by the 82nd Airborne Division Public Affairs Office. Thanks for listening, and please check us out next week.